All right. Um, so next on the agenda, we're, we're going to have uh, Professor Archer from uh, uh, Cornell. Excellent. Thank you. So I told Josh that when he sent an email inviting me to this event, it was almost the perfect timing because last week would have been impossible, and next week would have been doubly impossible. So this is well-timed and, and so far well-executed. So, um, so what I want to talk to you about today is um, electric chemical energy storage in batteries. Um, I want to basically do three things in this talk. I want to base convince you, first of all, why batteries are needed. Secondly, I want to give you a sense for the landscape, you know, in which batteries operate, and, um, and that landscape that has, in fact, led to lithium-ion batteries being king. What I want to do is hopefully convince you that um, there are lots of bottlenecks and technological hurdles that still remain. And these hurdles actually, um, in my view, uh, presents fertile grounds for nanomaterials and for just ingenuity. And I want to show you some things that are going on in my lab that attempt to basically push the limits a little bit on what's possible in, in battery technology. So the, um, the first few slides are things that, you know, this audience doesn't need to be convinced about, right? So, um, so we all know this, right? So this is the driver. So why is it we need to focus on electrochemical and other um, uh, novel energy storage platforms? Well, you know, we've got a bit of a problem, right? So we have, um, yeah, so we've got this, this, this interesting situation where we're CO2 levels in the atmosphere are rising. Whether you believe that this leads to climate change or not, this is serious, all right? And so when you see things like this, the current CO2 levels are the highest in 800,000 years, and, and the last time this happened, we had problems. It tells you that, you know, whatever we do, we can't exacerbate this situation. Now, what worries me is that um, we're not doing anything, right? In fact, if anything, we're going in the opposite direction, right? So what we're doing is, if you look at trends in um, global um, energy consumption, which I show here, um, they've been rising and rising fast. And if you look at where the rise is occurring, there's no end in sight, right? So the, the biggest rise has been happening in the developing world, right? So places like China, um, um, India, parts of South America. And these, these trends are about to just explode because these countries, as many of you know, because of the last recession and so forth, have been doing much better economically. Their population base has actually been living a more affluent life, and so the things we have, they want. And often the things we like are energy intensive, and so that actually creates a significant um, problem I see um, on the horizon. Now, um, this situation, I think, um, has a solution, uh, but the solution is uh, renewables, but they're not being used or exploited um, at the levels that one would think um, they, they should not be. So if we look at the U.S. Um, energy consumption portfolio, renewables account for roughly about 8% of, of, our, of our portolio. And of that, that 8%, the dominant... Um, I'm having trouble with this. Do you need another one? Yeah. Is there another one? Actually, I have my own. So there let's, let me do my own. Here, there we go. All right. Okay. All right. I forgot my own. All right. So... Um, so, uh, so, so hydro, wood, we are still burning wood, believe it or not, um, in growing numbers. Wind, geothermal. But my favorite is actually the one you just heard about, right? So solar cells and photovoltaics. And, and the reason it's my favorite is that I think innovative, innovative groundbreaking, game-changing solutions always come from systems where it's obvious they're game-changing. And I think solar is. Right, so the current consumption is just 1%, but 8.2 million quads hits the earth every year. You've all heard that before, which is 15,000 times what we use globally. And I'm hearing 50% efficiency from the previous talks. It tells me that if we're disciplined and, um, and, and in some sense strategic as a country, um, we have a potential solution to this problem. So where do batteries come in? Right? So batteries come in because of a, basically three interrelated and, and often uh, synergistic uh, factors, all right? So, um, so one is um, um, the sun doesn't always shine. In fact, the odd thing is that the sun typically shines during periods of low demand, like midday. 
the wind doesn't always blow, which is strange that it happens at night when we're asleep, typically, and I think it's driven by the moon and the tides. And because of that, and because of this intermittency, um, both sources of renewable energy requires a complementary storage technology to go along with it. And so um, that is driving quite a bit of the interest in batteries. The other, and I think more important driver, is actually us, right? So we want the new next coolest thing. We don't want it to be any bigger than the last coolest thing. And we don't want it to be any heavier. And we want it to be more powerful than the last coolest thing, right? And all of that requires a better battery. In fact, um, you know, this slide usually gets a lot of laughs when I speak to older audiences, right? Because they can actually remember <laughs> these cell phones. And the younger ones in the audience, you're probably thinking this is a special kind of doorstop, um, <laughs> okay? But, but, but in reality, if you speak to people in the field of designing these portable electronics, they will tell you that much of their design is actually around the battery. Batteries aren't powerful enough. They're not um, 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 predictable enough. Their form factors aren't flexible enough to design around. And so this is a, a pretty significant driver. And obviously now, you know, we're realizing that the same arguments for batteries um, in portable electronics apply for battery use and transportation. And so that has become a new kid on the block driving our interest in, in, in electrochemical storage. So I want to spend a few minutes just telling you where batteries sit because they're not the only mechanism for doing the things I said. They're not the only mechanism for storing electricity generated by photovoltaics. They're obviously not the only mechanism for carrying for, for, for portable um, electricity storage. And so this plot, sometimes called a Rangoon plot, basically shows the um, energy density. A big number on this scale basically means you can travel a longer distance on a single charge. The bottom plot is the power density. A big number on that scale basically means you can overtake that, that person who's um, slowing down the traffic. You can get more power um, out of your engine. And this is the internal combustion engine. So right away you see batteries can compete with the internal combustion engine in terms of the amount of energy stored, but they're non-competitive in terms of the power. And I think once we understand that, we are going to be in pretty good shape in terms of engineering systems that actually take best advantage of batteries where they're good. There are other things that are great for power, things like capacitors and so forth, but they unfortunately have the opposite problem. They can give us a lot of energy, but they can't do it for very long. And so in, in some sense, um, um, the internal combustion engine and its reliance on fossil fuels is, is, a, is kind of a big elephant. It is rare that you have a single technology that's really good on energy and really good on power. And so to basically take batteries and transpose them exactly into the same market space that the internal combustion engine dominates is, is actually silly. We will never win in, in that scenario. Now recognizing that batteries are good for longevity, the question is which batteries then does one use? And here I show a whole bunch of different technologies um, plotted in a slightly different way. So this is sometimes called a specific, um, the specific, the, the um, energy density. This is the energy per unit volume. And the specific energy, the energy per unit mass. Again, something that's high on this scale basically means it's light for the energy it packs. Something that's high on this axis means it's small for the energy it packs. And you will notice that of all the technologies, the lithium-ion battery technology is king. And so this is why lithium-ion batteries are, dominate the airwaves and dominate um, um, what we hear. There are some examples. Um, the, this is a really nice example, the Tesla, of where this actually appears to work really well. There are also, this is an old version of the iPhone, believe it or not, um, where, where it also works in portable electronics. There's some older examples, right? So this is um, Belgium, um, 19th century. This is a battery-powered car. It used lead-acid batteries. This is the USA. 1926, this is the predecessor of the cell phone. And this really big, tall guy, you see that thing he's carrying there? It's not his lunch, it's his battery, all right? And I'm told that the way they used to do it is they would always put a big, strong guy to make you feel you can do that too. And so the point is that um, lead-acid batteries are way down here. And so it's no accident that by exploiting lithium-ion batteries, we can actually carry around the power in our hands that we do. So I want to spend just a second telling you what a battery is and how it works to give you a perspective on what the challenges are, okay? 
So a battery basically is an electrochemical storage device. It converts chemical energy into electricity. In the charged state, a lithium battery holds lithium ions in the anode. When you discharge the battery, the lithium ions travel through the electrolyte. Electrons travel in parallel or in tandem to power an external circuit. When you charge the battery, exactly the opposite happens. So the challenges are these things are too costly. They don't store enough energy. They don't discharge fast enough. In other words, they don't give us enough power. They're not reliable, right? When you get the cell phone the first few days, it seems like you can speak on it forever. And very quickly, you notice that the amount of energy you get um, dissipates. The manufacturing uh, methods are complicated and non-standard and, and so on and so forth. But if you think about all of these problems, they're related to fundamental material challenges. So for example, if I want to create a battery that has more storage capacity, well, I've got to be able to pack more lithium in these materials, in the anode. And not more than that, that lithium has to be able to move from the anode into a cathode that welcomes it. In general, that's not the case. The lithium disrupts the cathode, disrupts the anode, and the end result is that the materials that actually host and, and, um, and, and um, provide lithium in the battery, these materials are operating well outside their thermodynamic limits, and so they're ready to just break. And so I want to just, um, um, just highlight, and, and this is not for you to read, but just to tell you there are lots of challenges, and these challenges are, are well known. Now, batteries, um, 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 because they're complicated, they've a attracted a lot of interest from the Department of Energy. And one of um, the outlets has been the so-called Energy Frontiers Research Center. There's one at Cornell um, called Energy Material Center at Cornell, EMC squared, kind of a cool logo. And I am part of that center, and that center combines basically um, people like myself, who focuses on transport phenomena in battery electrodes and electrolytes, theorists who focus on atomistic phenomena in batteries, to basically provide multi-scale modeling that are predictive so we can understand and solve, um, solve some of the problems. So I want to quickly um, just mention to you my pet project. And so my pet area has been nanomaterials for batteries. About five years ago, we discovered these very interesting hybrids. They're nanoparticles, functionalized densely with nano-sized ligands. They form the first example of what's called a self-suspended suspension, okay? And so the way I like to think of them is that on the scale of the particles, they're like powders, like sand. In the real world, they're beautiful liquids. The power these things provide is that I can put pretty much anything in the core, including battery chemistries, and I can take advantage of the processability that the corona, the polymer part, provides. And so this gives me a way of actually, in some sense, reinventing how I apply nanotechnology to solve battery problems. And here I just highlight one example. So silicon has been known for a long time to be among the most promising anode materials for lithium-ion batteries. It has an energy density that's about 10 times that of the currently used graphite materials in, in batteries. The trouble with silicon is that when it hosts lithium, it undergoes a pretty disruptive volume change, roughly about 400% of its volume changes. And if you think about it, when you store the lithium and you discharge, you store, you discharge, that is a cyclic process. And so that swelling, this swelling, swelling, this swelling is like a fatigue that ultimately causes the material to fail by this method called pulverization. Right? So, and because it pulverizes, the material loses connection to the energy outlet, the current collector that provides the electron to the external circuit, and that is obviously problematic, okay? So nano gives you a lot of advantages, and I'm happy to talk about them in detail. So surface to volume goes as one over size. So nano means you have a lot of surface. So you have a lot of access for lithium and electrons to get out. Time goes as length squared over a transport coefficient. Means small, gets you fast times, even for something that might be a poor conductor. So you can actually design batteries that have that property I described that they lack, power. And other things, so many other things, and, and we can discuss that um, um, afterwards. Now, so um, one of the things that these materials have given us the ability to do is to design batteries that in some sense push the frontier of what is possible. And so here I'm showing you typical batteries in terms of their maximum energy against different technologies. So this battery, for example, is what powers the Prius. This thing here at one point looked like it was going to power the Volt, but I guess no more. We're actually working out here. We're actually attempting to build batteries that actually, when fully um, functional, 
will compete with diesel fuel in terms of the amount of energy they can store. And so I think I have one more slide. And so this is meant to show you that these batteries also have challenges. It requires a lot of work, but lots of nice opportunities. So one of the things I really fun about science is that um, the entire literature said that if you want to build a lithium air battery, stay away from CO2. You have to stop CO2 from getting involved. We decided not to do that. We decided because our electrolytes are not as sensitive as others to CO2, we let CO2 get in the battery and discovered that CO2 is actually a pretty good feedstock for a lithium battery. And so we now have a concept where the CO2 emission from your car might actually be stored in the form of electrical energy in a battery that's connected to the exhaust. And so these are the sort of things that understanding nanomaterials um, and, 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 and the benefits they provide actually um, allow, allow one to take advantage of. So, um, so I, I've never given a 15-minute talk before. Okay, so, um, so, so this is all the stuff that I hope I've told you, right? So I've told you that basically there are three factors that drive our interest in battery technologies. I think that, you know, intermittency of renewables is ultimately the factor that will cause innovation in this space. But the real driver today is consumer demand. And to the extent that, you know, the first panel concluded that storage is not so solid when you actually do it on a cost basis, to the extent we're still talking about it, is because most of the technology is basically borrowed from consumer electronics. And so we're, in some sense, just piggybacking on, on what is known. Hopefully, I've convinced you that uh, batteries are really good for slow storage. They're not so good for fast storage. And if we're going to exploit them properly, we really need to design and engineer around the, uh, those characteristics. Manufacturing is an issue. The materials are reactive, and they require non-standard uh, manufacturing uh, systems. I am told that it takes 500 million to design a battery fab, to build a battery fab, 500 million. Most investors wouldn't want to touch that. And so we've got to come up with ways of designing batteries that work in fabs that are significantly less um, um, expensive. The, there's a drive, including in my group, to design batteries based on more renewable and available resources. I mean, lithium is only available in a few places in the world. If all of us adopt batteries at a rate that the government hopes we will, the price of lithium will be more expensive than the price of gold. And so we have to come up with alternatives to lithium. And so we've been working on things like the aluminum ion battery, the sodium ion battery that takes advantage of more abundant resources. And finally, I want to say, since many of you are students, is that these systems provide a lot of exciting opportunities, not only for controlling matter on a small length scales, but actually for doing cutting edge interdisciplinary research that I think matters, right? That defines a new direction, I think, for our country and, and potentially for mankind. So thanks for your time. And Hope to get some questions later.